our special yes, yes. For, for Mother's Day, honoring mothers. Um, this is a community that's been celebrating together for some 30 years, I believe. Uh, and that's about right, isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. And now, and now we're moving in a, a, a Unitarian tradition. Um, and we, we extend a special welcome to visitors and invite you to join us after coffee, after service, or coffee, and, and conversation. Um, uh, we hope that you will feel free to join us in any events that we hold that you might be interested in. My name is Keith Wiley, uh, and our, our speaker today for our service is my wife, Jacqueline McGregor, who's speaking on um, Mother's Day, Attachment, and the Seventh Unitarian Principle. Jacqueline's also going to lead us in a couple of songs from our songbook. And uh, the titles are in your order of service. So we'll be seeing this, and we'll be seeing one shortly. Um, next week's service, we will have a speaker from the West Kootenai Eco Society to talk about their ambitious plan for moving the, the Kootenais and the West Kootenais to 100% renewable energy by 2050. So, and we're going to try and couch that in somewhat of a spiritual concern about the future of our planet. Um, and, uh, and the following Sunday, I plan to do a service about the uh, wilderness camp up at Fry Creek on, and show you the slides and, and, and talk about how the wilderness camp works. So that's, that's the, the next plan. We will, we will have time for announcements just before the end of service today. That's the other thing I wanted to draw your attention to. So I ask you now to join me in a moment of stillness so that we may come into our spiritual space. The, uh, the flame lit in the chalice has become a symbol of Unitarian Universalism all around the world. And, and lighting it at the beginning of a service signifies our shared desire for light, awareness, and togetherness. And for opening words, we'll say, Come into this place of community and let its warmth nourish your heart. Come into this place of inspiration and let its words nourish your mind. Come into this place of peace and let it calm, let its calm nourish your spirit. Every Sunday morning, we light candles of joy and concern. It's a new tradition for us, but it's a chance to talk about things that happen to us and transitions and joys and, and concerns we have. Um, so I invite you, whoever is willing and wants to, to come and light a candle of con concern or joy. Oh, I can. say your name uh, so that we, so that, that's the tradition I'd like to establish. So. Hi, I'm Marcia Brondi, and um, I wrote a piece this week um, that I've been wanting to write for several years now, and it's a piece about the flood of 2006, uh, which came across our land, and uh, and how over the course of years we have created, um, with the help of many different people and government agencies, um, a situation that would put a stop to that, or at least for maybe a hundred year flood. Um, but I've been very moved lately uh, by 
all the pictures of what's happening in the Okanagan and in Quebec and uh, Ontario. And um, uh, so in a sense, I was sort of writing it for them as well. Um, and so I am lighting this candle for um, all the people that are being deluged by water right now. And may it stop soon. But may the health of the water go on to feed us because the water is a powerful thing for good and challenge. Thank you. I'd like to light a candle for Donald and Nancy, who are, I will be seeing for lunch today. Donald's my stepson and his wife, Nancy. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, I'm happy to be with them. And, uh, and I would also like to light a candle for all the mothers who are here today. I'm Carrie. I'd like to light a candle for all the mothers who have lost their children and are having a hard time today with, uh, in this world who have lost their children. And I've lost two sons, and it's a hard day for me, and this is for everyone. There's a spare candle there, Keith. Let's switch candles. Yeah. We're lighting your candle. Thank you. <laughs> There's a spare Oops, candle sorry. there, Keith. My name's Irene, and um, thank you all for being here, and I'm, it's really a pleasure to be here with Jacqueline giving a presentation. She has been very instrumental um, in my growth as a mother. Thank you, Jacqueline. And also wanted to acknowledge that a friend of mine um, is currently homeless, a mother herself who's lost a child. And if anybody really has any tips or leads on housing, I would be very appreciative of that. Okay. I don't know which one was it. Karen, and I'm lighting this candle for Ted. I'm concerned. Uh, hi, my name is Andrew Greger. This is my mom. Uh, this is my first time at a church function, but a Unitarian function more, more so. Um, and I would, I'd like to light a candle for, for my mom for raising me. Uh, she's really helped me develop into uh, a better human being, especially since I've moved closer to her. And uh, I'd also like to light, light a candle for our Mother Earth. 
uh, who sustains us and supports us throughout our lives. I'd like to light a candle too for, for my mother. As, as most of you know, my, my father died, I guess it's just about two weeks ago now, and we had a wonderful service. And I was just saying, my mom only spoke a few words afterwards, um, but it was very meaningful, but it's a hard time. I've got to call her later. But um, uh, we had a wonderful service for my dad, but it's just a hard time for my mom. Any other candles? If not, okay, I'll light one more candle for all those joys and concerns that we hold quietly in our hearts. Did it stay lit? I think someone else wants to. Oh, oh, do you, Katrine? Go ahead. I'm a child who lost her mother, and I want to light a candle for my mother. the affirmation of these candles. Uh, I was supposed to be a joint reading and I was supposed to get it in the order of service, but I, I omitted it accidentally. But it, we might try that in the future that we could say this together, but it goes, may the light of these candles inspire us to use our powers to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. And now, we have time for our song, which was out of order. Ah. So Jacqueline's going to lead us in the uh, spirit of life, which is in our duo tangs. It's, it's number one, two, three, but I, I don't know which, which order is it in. Is it easy to find? Halfway down, about halfway So I, I invite you to stand or rise as you are willing and able. You can feel free to stay seated if you want to. And, but stand if you like and we'll sing together on Spirit of Life. <laughs> speaker today. 
Jacqueline McGregor has been a Nelson resident for the last six years. Before that, she lived in Edmonton and belonged to the Westwood Unitarian Congregation, where she found a welcoming community that provided many things, but particularly a place where social justice and spirituality, great music, and attention to diversity were practiced. Uh, Jacqueline has a master's degree in social work and a blended family that includes our six kids, two cats, and an expanding, this year contracting bee colony. Jacqueline's interesting and appropriate topic this Sunday is a Mother's Day service on attachment and how it fits with the Seventh Unitarian Universalist principle, which affirms the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Jacqueline. All right. Okay. I'm going to flip this on. centuries uh, we have uh, in every culture and in every civilization there's been formal rituals to celebrate mothering and honoring, honoring Mother Earth. Mother's Day was also a holiday conceived by Unitarian Universalist Julia Ward Howe a few hundred years ago as an occasion for mothers to unite together with the goal of preventing war. How called on mothers to come together and protest what she saw as the futility of sons killing the sons of other mothers during the Civil War. Howell's vision was, was a Mother's Day of Peace, honoring peace, motherhood, and womanhood. And I think today in Nelson, there's a, an event happening at Lakeside, hopefully the rain um, ceases for that event. And, um, and that is also to promote her vision of peace. Um, in the 17th century, a clerical degree in England broadened the celebration of Mother's Day from one focused on the church and Virgin Mary to include real mothers, referring to the occasion as Mothering Day. I got to be in England this year on Mothering Day. It was kind of, it was really special. Um, Mothering Day became an especially compassionate holiday toward the working classes of England. Families across England enjoyed a family feast. Mothers were presented with cakes and flowers, and their children were given time for service in other households to come home to visit. During this Lenten Sunday, servants and trade workers were allowed to travel back to their towns of origin to visit their families. And talking about attachment, I can't imagine what that's like. They have small children leave their homes and go and live in other people's homes. Um, so there's lots of examples in our history of children and parents being separated from their families for one reason or another. Some of it's colonialization, some of it's war, which quality, all kinds of reasons. So today I'm going to talk about attachment as it relates to mothering and our primary experiences. In one way or another, each of you were born of a mother. And because we are human, it's likely that your relationship with that mother is, was, or will someday be challenging. If you identify as a woman, then it's almost certainly that your connection with this matter of mothering is or was sufficiently complex that it's sometimes hard to explain. As humans, we need other humans and not just any human 
but humans who are special to us. For many years, a sign of healthy adjustment was not needing people for support, and needing others was weak. And luckily, we've come a long way in, in having that idea. You know, a lot of us said, like, we're going to parent, and then our children are going to reach a certain age, and then they won't need us anymore, they're going to be self-sufficient, and that's really not true. Um, there was a man named John Bowlby who studied the development of children who had been separated for long periods of time from their primary caregivers, many who had grown up to have severely troubled lives. And he understood the crucial importance of the special and irreplaceable bond that develops between young children and their caregivers and between adults and their relationship partners, close relatives and friends. In fact, knowing that we exist in the minds of at least a few important others is a crucial part of feeling secure in the world, no matter what age you are. He said the need for relationship bonds follows us from the cradle to the grave. And this refreshing notion transformed the world of medicine, education, and psychology, and I believe has a place in the spiritual domain as well. I recently came across an essay titled Pre-Verbal Experience and the Intuition of the Sacred. And it was, uh, it was in a heavy tome of psychoanalysis, and it was written by this man named Kenneth Wright. And uh, last night I was trying to consolidate some of those ideas, and it, and, it, and it was just a little interesting trying to get all of these heady ideas, but I, I'm going to see if I can synthesize the general gist of this essay, because I thought it was important for today. So Kenneth Wright, he had discussed the idea that the capacity for creativity <coughs> and capacity to experience sacredness is developed in the pre-verbal stage during interactions between a mother and a baby, when the baby has no knowledge that it is separate from its mother, the concept of me and not me. The essay discussed that religions tend to be divided into two major groups, revealed religions, which are more or less institutionalized and impose a set of mandatory beliefs and practices and laws that may be viewed as patriarchal. And then in comparison, there are the natural religions, which include the teachings of Socrates, Buddha, and some of the teachings of Jesus. Natural religions are not so much concerned with conformity to practice in the letter of the law as with inward questions to do with the meaning of life. How do humans find fulfillment? How are individuals to find true satisfaction in their lives? They involve intuitive appraisal of the inner person's subjective experience. So this essay discussed that while the great world religions have been based on the insights of a few outstanding individuals, an intuition of the sacred falls within the realm of ordinary experience. What the ordinary person might call a significant moment, a moment outside of ordinary time, when the world or some part of it becomes lit up in a different way. For example, when a poem or piece of music speaks or sings to a part of the person's soul. He describes a feeling of validation and reluctance to let the moment go. This beautiful form is what I have always longed for, or it is almost a part of me. So the author of this essay suggested that these belong generically to a religious domain that is closer to the maternal and our first experiences during the pre-verbal period. 
early attuning interactions between infant and parents, provide recognition and acceptance, sharing and containment, and offer to the infant a pre-verbal experience with which to contain, recall, and manipulate their internal experience. So eventually, the baby starts to transition from that, that, that experience, that nonverbal essence of the baby and the mother, and starts to transition to understanding the difference between I and mother together and then separateness. And sometimes you can see this when a baby develops a fondness for a blanket or a favorite toy or something that the baby attaches to other than the mother. The baby uses this as needed to embody and recreate an experience of the mother or other significant caregiver. A transitional object. In this way, the baby becomes able to evoke the mother's presence in her absence, the beginnings of imagination. Chosen by the child provides comfort. That's not going to work. I apologize. So I apologize. All right. And I was praising this technology just moments ago. Just a little higher up on the Yeah. All right. Okay. How are we doing now? Okay. The transitional object. So. Transitional objects, blankets, soft toys, even sometimes the mother or caregiver or parent themselves. Um, a lock of hair, an earlobe, something that, something that evokes a sense of connection to, to the mother, but also is different and separate. So these transitional objects provide comfort, solace, predictability, and constancy, and represent a stable and predictable world. And some studies have shown that babies that have the transitional object grow up to have a greater capacity for empathy. So it's one of those things, those ineffable things that we you know, have noticed over time. So while objects and keepsakes remind us of our connection to our significant others, what about our actual human connections? The need to be in close relationship is embedded in our very genes. We are programmed by evolution to single out a few specific individuals in our lives and make them precious to us. We've been bred to be dependent on a significant other. The need starts in the womb and ends when we die. Throughout evolution, genetic selection favored people who became attached because it provided a survival advantage. In prehistoric times, people who relied only on themselves and had no one to protect them were more likely to end up as prey. Those who were with somebody who deeply cared about them survived to pass on to their offspring the preference to form intimate bonds. Over time, the ability to access the known and responsive caregiver facilitates secure attachment. This bond helps to preserve the safety and survival of not only our young, people of all ages, all ages feel more secure 
if there are at least a few trustworthy others to whom they can turn for support, help, or encouragement. In fact, the need to be near someone special is so important that the brain has a biological mechanism specifically responsible for creating and regulating our connection with our attachment figures. This mechanism, called the attachment system, consists of emotions and behaviors that ensure that we remain safe and protected by staying close to our loved ones. The mechanism explains why a child parted from his or her mother or father becomes frantic, cries uncontrollably until he or she reestablishes contact with her. These reactions are coined protest behaviors and we all still exhibit them as adults, we can become homesick or become distressed when we are rejected or invalidated by others. And, and we see this often. We see this where, for some strange reason, when we really want to be close to somebody, we're reacting in ways that tend to push people away from us. And, and it's helpful to know that this is, this is wired. We're wired to react in this way. Um, when we're feeling like we're going at risk of being disconnected from others. Most of us here today will have experienced parenting or care caregivers that are good enough, the good enough parenting that has enabled us to grow and develop. Even if attachments are disrupted, our psyche has remarkable resiliency to cope with these unfavorable attachment circumstances. And what we know is that if we have had some disruptions, our built-in drive to survive seems to prompt some individuals to turn up their antennae for signs of availability or rejection from others. Other individuals turn down their needs for closeness and support. So for an example, individuals who are a bit anxious about being connected to others tend to, tend to be a little anxious about that. They tend to be a little, their attachment antennae notices all the little details. They, they, they notice everything about someone that might, when someone's pulling away. And other people, have the opposite reaction. Their antennae is kept turned down and they get uncomfortable with too much closeness and prefer to see themselves as self-sufficient and avoid depending on others very much. Both of these kinds of responses make sense in the context of a challenging upbringing. So what was helpful to survival then in previous significant relationships may not be so helpful now. We know that we can learn to have a more regulated and secure way of being in the world. The practices of self-compassion and mindfulness are known to help us move towards a more secure way of being in the world. We can be a caring person to ourselves we can have some internal sense of basic self, safety, and well-being. As adults, we thrive if we are able to access a safe haven and secure base with significant others. Some examples of being a safe haven might include listening when the other is worried, being attentive when the other is sick, helping practically when the other is tired, inquiring about the other person's feelings. Examples of a secure base are supporting each other's work and activities, asking questions that reflect curiosity in each other's opinions, listening to each other's hopes and dreams. You can do this. So for me, when I read these markers of attachment in the context of of standing here in front of you all today, it was easy to make the connection to the role of spiritual communities, especially our Unitarian <coughs> communities that intentionally embrace these practices towards our membership. 
communities, caring communities such as ours, can serve to nurture and satisfy the need not only for connection, but for sacredness and spiritual communion and growth. The Unitarian Seventh Principle that respects the interdependent web of all existence is a really important statement to make. It does not just mean that we're connected to our environment. It means that we're connected to those special people in our lives and that we can form those bonds that sustain us and that we thrive on. So that comes to the end of what I have to say. And um, I'm just going to take a few moments to lead us in a bit of a meditation. Um, and at the end of that, um, we'll go on to our next part of the service. How are we doing for time? We're good. All right. The rain's interesting. I want to make a security blanket transition, which is special. <laughs> I just want to just invite us all to follow along in this meditation. So to begin with, see if you can position yourself as comfortably as you can. Shifting your weight so you're allowing your body to be fully supported with your head, neck, and spine aligned. And taking a couple of deep cleansing breaths, inhaling as fully as you comfortably can, sending the warm energy of your breath to any part of your body that's sore or tense or tight. Releasing egg, any or every discomfort. With each exhale, loosening and softening them with each in breath. Gathering up all the tension and breathing it out so that more and more you can be comfortable, relaxed, and easy. Noticing the action of the breath with friendly but detached awareness. And for this meditation, allow any sounds or sensations that are distracting you to also be sent out with the breath and maybe even include them as part of this meditation. So that inside you can be still and quiet. And I don't know if you are one of those people who can be still and quiet inside for a few seconds or even longer. Either way is fine, as with any meditation instruction. Just come back to your breath any time you notice that your mind has turned away to something else. And now as you continue to breathe easily, Imagine that you can take yourself to a place where you feel safe and supported, peaceful and easy. A place either in your imagination or real. A place from your past or somewhere that you've always wanted to go. It really doesn't matter. Just so it is a place that feels good and safe and peaceful to you. And as you continue to breathe easily, letting your body feel relaxed, 
and wonder if you can imagine the sense of being supported and comforted. Compelled. And some people find that it's easy to imagine that you're being rocked back and forth, increasing that sense of peacefulness. And as you allow your mind to let your breath continue to let your body feel relaxed and peaceful. So just be in this space for one more moment. Let the chimes ring, you can just, at your own pace, come right back into the room for the last few seconds. Thank you, Jacqueline. At this time, we're, we're going to do the offering for the service today. Um, we will receive uh, this morning's offerings. Some like to donate on a weekly basis on Sundays, others on a monthly basis. Myself, I do it more irregularly. Um, we invite you to contribute in the way and with the amount that you feel comfortable with. Did you want to place? Yes. Sure. Okay. And then once it's done, we'll, see, we'll, we'll sing uh, the, the short song, The Blessing of the Service uh, of the offer, Offering from You I Receive, which is in our songbooks. Well, in fact, that's, I'm going to donate as a check. Uh, in a, in a, for a period so that I can get a tax receipt. It, it, it does make a difference if, if you pay taxes. Yeah. Has everybody had a chance? The song is from You I Receive. It's, I think it's number 402. Is it, is it in the book? First, the first, one. first one. There we go. Just are we all set? Dale? Thanks. Okay, keep your eyes as you're willing and able, or stay sitting if you want, and we'll sing uh, from you I receive. We'll sing it through twice. It's short. showing the movie Sully, which is a new release, and it's about the airline pilot who, I think it was around four years ago, landed the aircraft in the Hudson River. And so they, the movie takes on, it's actually uh, biographical, and what happened to him from that moment on. And the American Film Institute put this, rated this movie in the top 10 of the year. 
2016. So probably worth taking a look at. <laughs> Here on Tuesday night? Here? Tuesday here. Yeah. Isn't it? 7 o'clock. So. Um, I have a couple of announcements. One, one just to reinforce the, that there is a peace rally. It will, will be in the Rotary Center. It starts at 2 o'clock. And I've been invited to uh, sing a couple of songs there. Right. So. I'm looking forward to it, and also just to let you know that there will be a poetry slam tonight in John uh, 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 in the coffee house downtown, right across from the from Wade's News. What time? Seven o'clock. Yeah, get there. Get there at six forty-five. <laughs> yeah. I don't even have any announcements, so we're good. We're, we're in good time, so we've got time to sing one more song. Um, the song is called, Come Sing a Song With Me. No, page two. Page two. Now, are there four verses? How many do you want to do? I don't think we should do four. Why not? <laughs> yeah, it's a wonderful song. It is, but it's very, very long. You can just play it. Well, we can, no, we can do two verses. We can just do four. We've got ten minutes. Yeah. I'm outvoted. Let's do four verses. Okay, can you stand as you're willing and able to sing, Come Sing a Song with Me, a great Unitarian song. called The Womb of Stars. The womb of stars embraces us. Rem remnants of their fiery furnaces pulse through our veins. We are of the stars. The dust of explosions cast across space. We are of the earth. We breathe and live in the breath of ancient plants and beasts. Their cells nourish the soil. We build our communities on their harvest of gifts. Our fingers trace the curves carved in clay and stone 
by forebears unknown to us. We are part of the great circle of humanity gathered around the fire, the hearth, the altar. We gather anew this day to celebrate our common heritage. May we recall in gratitude all that has given us birth. So we extinguish the flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. That we, that we carry, these we carry in our hearts until we come together again. Boy, this is getting waxy.